my name is Derek Brown. I'm a medical physicist from the University of California, San Diego in the United States. I've been at this clinic for about five years now. No, sorry, six years now. And I moved down here from Canada. I'm origi originally from Canada. It's a real pleasure for, for me to be here and to participate with you in this course. And I, re I really thank the organizers for putting together such, such a great course and for you know, being so dedicated to providing educational content free across, across the globe. But that's, that's something that I have uh, personally been involved in, in in a long time, and I'm, I'm really passionate about it. And I, I really love the work that Rails Contra Cancer has been doing, and I, I really want to commend the amount of time and effort and success that that group is having. So I'm really glad that you are all here. This presentation is definitely meant to be more of a conversation than a presentation. So we're going to talk about hidden red flags in IMRT treatment planning and specifically in IMRT treatment commissioning. So I, I presume since you're in this course, all of you are in the process of commissioning IMRT systems. So either just about to start or halfway through or have recently completed IMRT treatment planning commissioning. And what I really want to do in this presentation, I know you've, you've been sort of talking about the details of how to do the commissioning process, what kind of chambers to use, what sort of measurements you need to make in order to have IMRT work properly. So you've been sort of taking a, a deeper, closer look at exactly the types of measurements that you need to be making. And in this presentation, I want to take a little bit of a step back and revisit the reasons for doing all of those measurements thoughtfully and thoroughly and carefully. Okay, so we're, we're, gonna, we're not gonna talk about specific IMRT commissioning measurements in this presentation. We're gonna talk about why it's so important that we do those because I, I mean, I know what it's like, right? Sometimes you're faced with all of these, what are probably a hundred different measurements and you could be thinking to yourself, you know, do I really need to do all of these measurements? It seems like a ton of work. Is it really important? And it's kind of easy to talk yourself into a place where you would think, okay, well, it's, it's not that important that I do all of these measurements and I could just skip some of them or some of them aren't quite right. It doesn't matter. And what I want to do today, by the end of today, I want everybody to be on the same page that it really, really, really does matter. It really matters for your, for your patients. And that's, that's why we're all here, right, is for, is for our patients. And you would be doing your patients a disservice if you didn't take all of these measurements really, really seriously and actually understand the measurements, not just taking the measurements and, and writing them down, but understanding them. So here are the objectives uh, for this presentation. We want to understand the importance of commissioning. And even more importantly than that for me, we want to understand the impacts of what happens when things go wrong. We want to discuss several high profile incidents in radiation oncology. We have to always have those in the back of our mind. And in particular, I want to discuss an IMRT commissioning event that occurred at my institution, UC San Diego, about two or three years ago. So we'll go into that in detail and, and see how things worked out. It's pretty, it's, a, it's actually a really interesting, I think really informative event. And I was fortunate to be a part of it at UC San Diego. <coughs> Okay, so in terms of errors or incidents that can happen in radiation oncology, we have sort of two distinct types of errors. We have sporadic errors, which are really errors that occur sort of randomly. They don't always occur in the same place. They're one-off errors that typically impact a single patient. Does that make sense? So this would be something that maybe happens in a specific treatment planning for a specific patient, and that would impact that single patient, but it wouldn't impact other patients that are being treated in the same clinic. We also have systematic errors, and these are errors that would impact a larger group of patients, maybe even every single patient that is treated on a certain LINAC. So why is it important for us, this is a question for the group, why is it important for us to think about sporadic versus systematic errors? So before, you, before someone answers, both of these can result in significant severe impacts, right? Both of these types of errors can cause our patients to die and they have in the past and we're gonna talk about some of those. But why is it important for us 
to think about sporadic versus systematic errors in radiation oncology. Anyone want to want to think about that? Want to comment on that? Fama, what do you think? Hi. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Let me sing. <laughs> okay. Let's. <laughs> Marie, go ahead. Oh. No, you can go ahead, Fama. Okay. You see, yeah, about uh, sporadic uh, errors, I think you explained it uh, very well. It's talked about uh, randomly error. Yeah, usually we encounter that kind of problem. Even for through DCRT, I think also, not only for IMRT, mm -hmm. but also mm -hmm. for through DCRT. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, that's exactly right. Okay. I, I think also, you know, in thinking about sporadic errors, ones that happen just one off and impact a, a specific patient, there in terms of being in the clinical environment, we need to be thinking about looking at every single plan for every single patient. That's how we're going to catch sporadic errors. The reason systematic errors are kind of interesting, where, where do systematic errors come up? How would you create a systematic error in your clinic? For example, with the Linux, sometimes uh -huh. you can encounter some problem with the MLC. Yep. Maybe, yeah. This kind That's of problem also can happen at any time during the treatment. Yep. So if you're, it, that's, that's a great example. If your MLCs are not moving correctly, then they won't move correctly for every single one of your patients. And that would be a systematic error. In the context of what we're talking about today, IMRT commissioning, what if we got something wrong in our IMRT commissioning? How many patients would it affect? A lot of patients. Not a lot of patients, yes. Exactly. So it, when we make an error in commissioning, that almost certainly is a systematic error and it's going to mm -hmm. impact all of our patients. Yeah. And we really don't want that to happen. Right. But both of these types of errors are important. And I, I want to just take some significant amount of time and go through examples of each one of these types of errors. And I think many of us will have heard about these errors, but I, I want us all to understand exactly what's gone wrong in, in each of these cases. So let's start off by talking about the New York incident. So this gentleman in the middle of the picture, his name is Scott Jerome Parks, and he was about 40 years old and he was diagnosed with oropharyngeal cancer. So cancer of the head and neck. So he lived in New York City and the doctors recommended as part of his treatment that he undergo a course of radiation. So we, we treat these oropharyngeal cancers all the time in radiation oncology. Many of you will already be also treating these, maybe already with IMRT, sometimes with uh, 3D CRT. But it's a very common type of cancer that we would treat with radiation therapy. So he's diagnosed, he's 40 years old. Doctors recommend a course of radiation therapy. So IMRT, um, an IMRT treatment plan, head and neck treatment plan is created. The dose is approved by the doctor. The doctor looks through the dose distribution and they like the dose distribution. They say, okay, let's go ahead and treat this plan. Physicist looks through the plan. They like the plan. And then what do we do typically before any IMRT treatment? We do a patient specific IMRT QA, right? So anytime we have dynamically moving MLCs while the beam is on. We're actually gonna test that that works as we, think it, as we think it does before we actually deliver the treatment to the patient. And we call this patient-specific IMRT QA. So there's lots of different ways of doing this. The image that I'm showing on the left here is a variant solution to this. It's called portal dosimetry. And essentially we're delivering that IMRT beam <clears throat> on the LINAC without the patient and measuring what is happening. And then we're comparing that to what we expect to happen. And if everything works out, we say, okay, this is good. Let's move forward and, and treat our patient. Have you talked already about IMRT patient specific QA, Samuel? Um, hello? Hello, Samuel, in, in this course? Yeah. yeah I, I think in our previous lecture, uh, 
a little bit was shared on the patient specific QA. Okay, great. So in our clinic, I think it, as in many clinics in the world, before we would treat any IMRT field, we would do this specific IMRT QA. So in this case, they did it. So they create the plan, doctor likes the plan, physicist likes the plan, physicist does the patient specific QA, everything is good. They say, okay, let's treat the patient. So, so far everything is normal, right? Not, no news so far. So they deliver four fractions for treatments of this plan, and that is done completely correctly. And then after the fourth fraction, the doctor or the physician looks at the plan again and says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't like exactly how the plan looks in this spot and that spot and the next spot. Could we please make a new plan and try and reduce the hot spots a little bit? Okay. So it's obviously a rush now, right? Because they've delivered four fractions. They're going to deliver another treatment tomorrow. So they have a very compressed time frame in which to do this. So the dosimetrist or the physician goes into the plan. Uh, sorry, the physicist goes into the plan. They create a new plan, reducing these hot spots. And <clears throat> the doctor looks at the plan and they say, yes, we like this plan very much. Let's go ahead and treat this plan. The physicist says, great, I'm going to get it all ready to go. And they try and save the plan that has been approved. And while the plan is being saved, the software fails and the computer is rebooted. Has anyone ever, <laughs> it's a silly question, but we've all seen this message pop up in Windows, right? Fatal error has occurred, you have to reboot the system, or maybe the system just stops responding and you have to press control alt delete and reboot the computer. So during the saving process, this happens. The physicist working at the computer reboots the computer and brings the plan back up. So once the computer comes back up online, uh, the plan is reopened, but because there was an error during saving, it, de it defaults to the last correctly saved version. And in this case, that happens to be a version without M any MLCs at all. So it's essentially just open fields. Okay, Does it, is that clear for everybody? Excellent. Thank you. And nobody noticed. Excellent. Thank you. Nobody notices that the plan has reverted to an earlier. Not clear. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Did someone have a question? Uh, it sounded like he said it was un unclear, but I'm not sure. It's not Sorry, I think we lost the audio again, Mr. John. If you could, if you could ask the question again. I think Mr. John is not clear about what you just said. It's not, not clear. Okay, I'll, I'll try the explanation again. So they create a new plan and the doctor likes the plan and the physicist likes the plan. And then when they try and save it in the computer, the computer crashes and they have to restart the computer. So when they pull the computer back up and they open the plan again, the, it automatically reverts back to the last successfully saved version of the plan. And in this case, that happens to be one where there are no MLCs in the field at all. So when we're talking about IMRT plans, usually most of the field is covered with MLCs and just a tiny little bit is open as it's being delivered. In this case, because the plan did not save correctly, it saved the last version where the MLCs are just way out here and it's essentially just an open field. There's no modulation of the beam at all. Did that, did that help, Mr. John? Okay, great. So unfortunately- No, thank you. Yep, you're, you're very welcome. Thank you, thank you for asking. Unfortunately, nobody notices that the plan has saved back to a different version and they just move forward. So here's, a, here's an interesting part of this incident. In this clinic, they actually had a formal policy that stated that patient-specific IMRQA only needed to be done before the delivery of the fifth fraction of any plan. So that was a formal policy that they had. So in this case, because their timelines were so compressed or, or so short, they decided to go ahead and treat the patient without performing patient-specific QA, thinking that they would perform it once they had time a few days later. And interestingly, that was actually okay according to the policies of that clinic. 
that's a, that's a terrible, terrible policy. I just want to make it very clear. We should not have that policy and we're about to find out why. So they go ahead <clears throat> and this is just showing exactly, Mr. John, what we were talking about. So most of the time, the MLCs are co covering the vast majority of the field as we're delivering this plan. But in this case, because it had saved to a previous version, there were essentially no MLCs in the field at all. And we're just delivering an, an, open, an open field. So they delivered three fractions of this new plan, essentially an open field. So I think most of you will have enough experience with IMRT and you can just think about it intuitively. If during IMRT we're blocking most of the field while we're delivering it, we need to have a lot of MUs in order to get any significant dose. Typically between five, between three and six as times as many MUs as we do when we deliver an open field, okay? So now we're delivering three fractions of essentially an open field, in this case with six times as many MUs. So it's essentially a six times overdose for three fractions. Patient-specific IMRQA is eventually performed before the fourth fraction is delivered. And the physicist obviously sees very, very clearly there are no MLCs in the field. They've just been delivering this essentially open field now for three fractions at six times the intended number of MUs or six times the intended dose. So this is a huge, huge overdose. Okay. The consequences of this is that <clears throat> Scott Jerome Parks dies two years after, after the delivery of these three, three fractions at six times the intended dose. And those two years were, you know, extremely painful for him. Just a slow decline, inability to eat, inability to swallow, inability to talk, just massive complications from this substantial overdose. And he dies uh, two years later. Received 39 gray in three fractions to much of his head and neck. And he died when he was 34 years old. So really, really, really sad story and a true story. And one that could happen in any of our clinics. This could happen in my clinic tomorrow. So question for you, was this incident sporadic or systematic? Uh, sporadic. This is sporadic. sporadic because it impacted um, a single patient. Sporadic. Yep, that, that's exactly right. So in the context of thinking about- these it, is, it is sporadic. Sporadic, yep. You, you, you're, you're all getting it. That's exactly right. So in, in the context of sort of having a safety mindset in the clinic, we have to, keep this in the back of our minds that this is something that could happen in any of our clinics to any of our patients. And that's why it's so important for us to do patient specific QA. That policy that the department had that they had to do IMRT QA before the fifth fraction, that was because they had in their minds, if, if there is an error, it will be a small error. It won't be a large error, but clearly that doesn't work. So I think most, clinics in the world now would say, you need to do this before the first fraction. And this was really sort of a wake up call for the industry and for the field of radiation oncology. It was really this incident that started the field of radiation oncology getting really serious about quality and safety. <clears throat> Any questions or comments about this error? Is this an error that you had heard about before? Yes, I want to comment and ask a question as well. First of all, the comment is that you should not believe blindly on the record and the verify system. And secondly, I was thinking that because, you know, as the IMRT load is increasing in the clinics, it's difficult to do the pre-treatment quality assurance for every patient. Mm -hmm. So what is your advice on that? Should we, because if someone is doing IMRT for the last 10 years, 15 years, once they get enough confidence, they're not doing for every patient, rather selectively sometimes they are doing. So is it something, do it wisely or should we go for every patient? I mean, 
You, you know what, that's, that's a really interesting question and it is a, a really interesting problem. And I would suggest that most clinics are doing patient-specific QA for every patient, even after 15 years. At, at our clinic, we do it for every single field and for every single patient. But your, your point is a really, really good one. That takes a substantial amount of time, right? It depends, the amount of time that it takes depends on how you do it. So if you have to set up a phantom and take a film measurement and then process that film measurement, this is taking you know, half an hour per patient. And if you have a lot of patients undergoing IMRT, this is probably not sustainable. And then you'll be in a place just like you described where you're thinking, you know, it's too much. We can't possibly do this for every single one of our patients. So it, if that's the case, I would work to streamline that QA process. And there are many different ways of doing pretreatment IMRT QA, all the way from what I described, setting up a phantom, taking film measurements, to running it through a secondary dose calculation software. So there you're just looking for MLC breaking points, making sure that they are in the right place at the right time and that the dose that the, the treatment planning system is giving you is accurate. So that could be as much as, as is needed. And then maybe every fifth patient, you do a full measurement or every second patient, you do a full measurement. And in that way, you bring your workload down by a half. But I would say that for every single patient at the moment, you need to do some form of pre-treatment IMRT QA. Does it, is that helpful at all? Yes, yes, it is. Thank you. So the solution that I showed on the, on the screen a little while ago is the solution from Varian. And I'm not, I'm not saying anything good or bad about Varian. But for us, we really like this solution because you can deliver it almost in between patients. It only takes about two minutes to deliver that. So we actually have our therapists on the machine, whenever they have a break, they'll just open some of these up and deliver them, deliver them, deliver them. So it's all, it almost happens in an automated way. So that's a good solution as well. I think that costs more money, but <clears throat> it's, it's an example of a way to make, make that at least possible to do. As you were also, sorry, as you were showing, you know, the, the portal dosimetry, Mm -hmm. And uh, I have used that portal dosimetry. The failure rate is very low for that. That's one of the concerns as well because their software is built in by the Varian and mm -hmm. they, are, they are using the same thing there. Modulation by the Eclipse and then the analysis by the same vendor. So it's, the failure rate is very low for, for portal imaging, portal dosimetry. That, that's a great point. It, it, is very, it is very low. And, and to that point, it's not designed to catch you know, very small errors, but it would catch very easily would catch a 10% error, a 5% error, no problem. But it's a, it's a good point that the failure rate for that is very low. I think the failure rate for IMRT in general is very low. The problem is that when it does fail in a catastrophic way, it has catastrophic consequences. That's the problem. And any other questions or comments about this specific event? If not, I, I want to move now to describing an IMRT commissioning event. Uh, one question. Yep. Yes, please go ahead. About the, the New York event, I was wondering, you mentioned that with the open field, the radiation that was delivered was about three to six times. Mm -hmm. when, when you put the dose in the treatment planning system, for that open field. Mm -hmm. I think it should calculate the monitor units for the open field. That's, that is such a great question. And you're, you're absolutely right. The problem is yeah. when, they open, when they open the plan again, they didn't even look at it because they had already looked at the dose distribution and confirmed with the doctor that everybody liked the dose distribution. So they didn't even look at it. Okay. Yeah, but that's a, that's a, a very good question and, and really good to notice that. You're right, if they had pressed calculate again, it would not have been so bad. Obviously still bad because there's no sparing of organs at risk, but it would not have been a six times overdose. Okay, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. 
Okay, so in the in the summer of 2017, we purchased from Varian one of their new linear accelerators called the Halcyon machine. I don't know if anyone has heard of the Halcyon machine, but at the time that we purchased it, we got the fourth one that they ever made. So it was really, really early on. Not very many places had this. They had only made four of them. <clears throat> and in the Halcyon, the, the actual linear, linear accelerator is identical to what we have on our other machines, but the MLC configuration is different. So they actually have MLCs, instead of just being like this, they have two sets of MLCs that are sort of overlapped on each other, and they have that on each side. So that, that part doesn't really matter. Just to say that the MLC configuration on this system was brand new for Varian, and it was brand new for us. And we have a really amazing physicist that works with us, Todd Atwood, and he led the commissioning work and performed a series of end-to-end -end tests. And he actually led this whole effort for us and did a really, really amazing job of this. I'm just kind of reporting what happened. I was peripherally involved. Okay, so new LINAC for us, new MLC configuration for us. So what did we decide to do? We thought, hey, well, the, the best thing that we can do, and I'm, I'm a big advocate of paying really close attention to end-to-end -to -end tests. So does everybody know what an end-to-end -end test is? So th this is where you would take a series of plans, maybe 10 plans that you had already delivered in your clinic, and you would calculate those plans on a standard phantom that would allow you to measure dose at specific points. So with an ionization chamber and with film. Okay, so we take those plans and we calculate them on this standard phantom that we have. And then from the treatment planning system, we know what dose we would expect within that phantom. And then we take that phantom over to the linear accelerator and we deliver the exact same plan on that phantom and we measure the dose. And then we can compare our measured dose to our calculated dose. Is this something that you have talked about already in this course? An end-to-end -end test? No, not yet. Not yet. Okay, does anybody have any questions about that? Because for me, it is the most complete way to test your system. And I would never ever treat a patient on a LINAC where end-to-end -end tests have not been performed. So I wanna make sure everybody understands the concept. So you would do all of, let's say you do all of your commissioning, whatever it is. Very, very important that before you treat any patients, kind of like the last step of commissioning, you take these plans, calculate them on a phantom, deliver those plans on the same phantom, and then you could compare measured dose versus calculated dose. It's really the only way you can know that your system as a whole is functioning. And this is great, right? Because it tests your CT scanner. It tests your Helms field unit to electron density calibration curve. It tests your dose calculation algorithm. It tests your MLC motion. It literally tests everything that you care about in IMRT commissioning. So I'm a huge advocate of this. I think we'll probably talk more about this later. But in any case, for this example, <clears throat> we essentially said we're going to take 10 plans and do end-to-end -end testing with these 10 plans. Okay. And then, you know, in the back of our minds, all of us were thinking, okay, this is, you know, Varian Medical Systems, they're a great company, all of our linear accelerators that we've ever used that are from Varian work really well, we hardly ever have any problems. So we'll do these 10 end end tests, and everything should be good. We should be able to move forward. Okay, so here's just an image showing this standard phantom. So here's the standard phantom. Here is a head and neck dose distribution that we've calculated on this phantom. And then we have one point here where we're gonna be able to put an ionization chamber. And we have another slice in here where we're gonna be able to put um, some film so we can measure the dose distribution. So we do this for 10 plans, something like 10 plans. And here are the results. So TPS is, this is the treatment planning system dose. So this is our calculated dose from the treatment planning system. And this is in centigrade. So here we go, that's what we get. And then here's our measured doses. So we actually deliver this plan on the Phantom and here are our measured doses. And you can see on the side here, the difference, the percent deviation between those two. And we really have anywhere from sort of two to 6% deviation. 
and it's all in the same direction. Our measured dose is all, let's say, let's just call it 4% low. What do, what do you think about that? If you found this in your clinic when you were commissioning a new IMRT system, what would you do? Mwape, what would, what would you do if you, if you found these results? Would you say, okay, this looks okay. We're, all of our patients will get 4% less dose. Let's go ahead, let's just move forward and treat patients. The, the percentage differences are not that big. The deviation is not that large. Uh -huh. I think two to six percent is within tolerance. Uh, I believe someone answered in the chat as well. Asad has said that it's uh, not acceptable. I have recently done some end-to-end -end tests. Okay, great. Is there anything worrying about the uniform direction of these dose deviations? Mwape, I, I, I understand what you're saying, you know, two, think, uh, two, two to three to four percent, maybe not bad, but would you be I worried? if you look at... Uh, Sorry, Rahim, go ahead, please. Yeah, you can see the consistency is uh, between the measured and the TPS dose. They are, you know, the, it's always TPS is higher than as compared to the measured dose. So we need to really look at the, <laughs> our chamber and we need to really recommission our chamber. We look at the factors, mm -hmm. and then we might, yeah. This is great. So that's exactly what we did. We said, so in our case, we said, you know, 2% may be okay, but 6% and everything's in the wrong, you know, everything's in the same direction. There's definitely a problem. We, we're not going to treat patients until we figure out what that problem is. So we did, Rahim, that was very good. We did exactly the same thing. Let's look at our chamber calibration. Let's look at how we're doing our measurement. When we put the measurement point in the treatment planning system, is it in a high dose gradient? So maybe it's very difficult for us to measure that dose. We did all of these things and we thought about it and we thought about it and we looked at everything and we changed a few things and we brought in an, a few other plans to do end-to-end -end testing and guess what we found? Exactly the same thing. So no matter what we did on our side, we could not explain this two to six percent lowered measure dose. And we spent about two weeks trying to figure it out on our side because we felt like this must be something wrong with what we're doing. We must just be missing something. And we tried and tried and tried and tried. And no matter what we did, we couldn't get rid of this 2 to 6% lowered measured dose. <clears throat> so we started involving Varian medical systems and we started having discussions with them. And we worked really closely with them for, again, about two weeks. And they started doing their own measurements on their own systems that they had at the factory where they built these. And in fact, they started to find exactly the same differences. And they tracked those differences down to how they had modeled their MLC. Remember, it's a new MLC for Varian, new MLC for us, how they had modeled that MLC in the treatment planning system. So eventually, after a lot of discussions and a lot of close collaboration, with Varian, Varian came to the realization that they had made a small mistake in how they modeled their MLCs in the treatment planning system. And they actually made an adjustment to that, released new software in the treatment planning system, sent this new software to us in the treatment planning system, and we redid this, and here are the results of what we found. So now we're varying between essentially plus or minus 1%, right? So really much more accurate measured dose versus calculated dose. And all that they changed was a little modeling factor that they had for those new MLCs in the treatment planning system. So this is much more what we would expect to see that they're going in different directions. It's all essentially plus or minus 1%, 1.5%. So that's sort of a random deviation around 0%. So when we saw this, we thought, great. Now we've done these end-to-end -end tests. We can show that what we calculate in the treatment planning system is what we measure when we deliver it. And that's what we care about most. And when we saw that, then we said, okay, let's go ahead and start treating patients. Any comments or thoughts about just, that? Uh, just a quick question regarding, for my own curiosity, 
these kind of softwares are they not approved by FDA before clinical implementation? They are, and that's right. They did manage to make that change in a way that did not require them to go through FDA approval again. Yeah, but you're exactly right. We were thinking the same thing. Hold, hold on, just one one minute. You're, you're exactly right. We were thinking exactly the same thing. You know, if this is a problem with the software, it's going to take, you know, another year to get FDA approval. But they did manage to implement it in a way that didn't require that, thankfully. So I think, you know, uh, uh, sorry, go ahead. I have a question. Thank you for that presentation. Let's say we encounter this in our clinic and we've tried possible best to resolve this. Uh, we couldn't. Are you saying that we should refer to the machine maker like Varian or Electa to resolve the problem if we've tried all our possible best yet we couldn't resolve it? Yes. I, yeah, definitely. There, there are two options here. So you try and figure it out on your own. That's the first option. Okay. There, there are three, right. three options here. So you try and figure it out on your own. The next thing to do is to, and you can do these simultaneously. You can contact other clinics that have the same type of LINAC and ask okay. them if they've seen these sorts of things. Okay. okay. So in our case, we actually did that because there were three other LINACs in the U.S. at that time. We contacted okay. all of those departments to see if they had any suggestions for what we were finding. And the third thing to do is to contact the vendor because the, the vendor, Varian and Electa, they want more than anything for everything to be delivered correctly. So they have a, you know, they have a big incentive to make things right. And they know their systems better than, than we do, right? Because they design yeah. and make them. So I think yeah. involving the vendor is a really great idea. Yeah, thank you very much. But so just a, a quick question. Was this an incident or what could have been an incident? Would that have been sporadic or systematic? Systematic. Systematic. Every, systematic. Single one working, every single one of our patients would have had that same underdose. And we would have been underdosing every single one of the patients that was treated on that machine by two to 6%, right? Two to 6%, okay, it's not catastrophic, but it's every single patient. And for sure over the, I don't even know, 500 patients that we treat on that LINAC per year, that we would have some tumors that would have been controlled that would otherwise not be controlled because of that underdose. And that would be terrible, terrible outcome. So these type of systematic errors that happen at the time of commissioning, we were, we were just lucky through the great work of Todd Atwood that he managed to not only find this systematic error, but also track down a solution and make things better. That was great but we could have easily been on a path where we would have been underdosing our patients by two to 6%, every single one of our patients. So in terms of commissioning, it's really the sort of the systematic errors that we are worried about on the commissioning side. There are quite a lot of other examples. And with the, with the little bit of remaining time, if we have more questions, please jump in and ask questions, whether it's about this or not. But otherwise, I'll just move forward and describe another commissioning incident that had a significant impact on patients. This happened in Toulouse, France, where they were commissioning a new stereotactic radiosurgery program. Everybody knows what SRS is, right? Using very, very small fields to treat very, very small lesions or very, very small tumors in the brain. And so typically, when you have a very, very small field, this is maybe not the greatest representation of a small field, but it's the best picture I could find. You want to use a very small chamber, right? So the entire volume of the chamber is contained within the open part of the field. So we, for SRS, we would use tiny, tiny, tiny pin, they're called pinpoint chambers. What this group in Toulouse did, they didn't realize that. And they used a very large chamber where some of the chamber would have been blocked by the MLCs. And when you do that, because these chambers are calibrated to, the vo to their volume and they require, in order to make accurate measurements, charge particle equilibrium, you measure much less dose using a larger volume chamber than you would with a smaller volume chamber. So they did that. They, they used that lower dose measurement to calibrate their LINAC. And when you use a lo uh, lower than expected measurement to calibrate your LINAC, you end up having a higher than expected output on your LINAC. And they treated approximately 145 patients 
received a 25% overdose. So that's, that's, that's significant. 145 patients receiving a 25% overdose because of an error in commissioning. Okay, so this happened. And then really, really amazingly, this was widely reported in the field and a lot of people knew about it. And two years later, the exact same problem came up again in the US. And I think this, this time it was a 17% overdose and I think it was only about 100 patients, but equally bad, right? So I really just wanna bring the message that, you know, doing an entire test of your system, first of all, entire test of your system with an end-to-end -end test from CT through dose delivery is extraordinarily important and can be incredibly valuable, right? And you can only really do that once you've come to a place where you've done all of your commissioning measurements, you think everything is in the right place, you think everything is working, now you do your end-to-end -end system testing. IMRT in particular is dangerous because it is susceptible to both sporadic and systematic errors. It's not complicated to do this commissioning, but it definitely does require careful planning and execution. All of you have the skills and knowledge to be able to do this commissioning. It's just difficult sometimes to find the amount of time required to do it properly. And I would urge you, please don't treat patients until you are absolutely sure that your system is working, is working properly under all the conditions for which you're gonna be using it. Any uh, thoughts or, or comments? Things, things can and do go wrong. And you know, in radiation oncology, when things go wrong, then our patients, um, our patients can die or have severe complications that we did not intend. Amy, did I see a raised hand? Yes, it looks like uh, Saad raised a hand. I would like to ask about the question for patient specific quality assurance while using PDIP. Derek, are you using PDIP for every patient? And is there anything else you are using for patient specific cure apart from PDIP? <clears throat> yep, that's a really great question. So. If we have the ability to do uh, PDIP, we do it for every single patient. And for some specific scenarios, we don't have the licenses to be able to do that. And then we have a phantom that we take out, much like the phantom that I showed you that we used for commissioning of that LINAC. And we calculate the plan on that phantom. We put an ionization chamber uh, in the phantom, and then we compare TPS calculated dose and measured dose. Okay. But only for very only for very specific situations do we do that. Okay. Uh, what the, how any numbers are failing in your scenario? For example, from our experience, we are just started and we had around fifty patients, but this, there's no no much failure for us. Any uh, for of more than ninety seven percent of the gamma rate is being achieved till now. Yeah. So your experience would be. That is exactly our experience as well. And every now and again, we feel like if none of these are ever failing, why, why are we still doing this? It, it can feel like a waste of time until you think back to the New York incident, yeah. right? If we can catch that one, one or two times where something bad is happening, then, then we're really happy about that. And then it makes everything seem worthwhile. Right, and I know it's hard, you know, if it, if it hasn't happened in your clinic, it seems like a far away thing, but you can um, take that New York incident and put it into your clinical environment. And I know in my clinical environment, something similar could happen for sure. Yeah. No, I mean, nobody, no fault of anybody or anything like that. Oh, oh, thank you. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? Yes, please go ahead. I had an opportunity to work in a hospital where they were using the, doing stereotactic techniques using cyber knife. And on a few occasions, I, you know, as you have said, it's a lot of work and some, some physicists complain that we don't have to do this for all the patients. If we can just get the most complicated plan and deliver, then we, we are sure our machine can deliver 
for all the plans if we just get one most complicated plan. But I think, as you have said, it's if we can catch just that one error, we can we can save a patient. So it's important to do for all the patients, patient specific QA, IMRT. Yeah, and I do. You know, I this is, this came up earlier, and I think you're you're making a great point, Mwakwe, as as well. You know, if you there are different types of patient-specific IMRTQA, right? All the way from a very complicated measurement that could take an hour per patient to a dose calculation that could take five minutes per patient to, and then everything in between. I mean, the PDIP that we use takes probably seven minutes per patient, you know? So I think you need to choose and design your system in a way that reflects the amount of time and resources that you have. If you only have 10 minutes per patient to do IMRTQA, then you need to find something that fits into that time slot. You know, it's not, it's not good enough just to say, well, we don't have time, so we're not gonna do it, or we can only do it on every 10th patient. I think you could do something very quick and simple for every single one of your patients, and then maybe every fifth patient, you do a more in-depth QA, I can see that depending on your resources and the system, the sort of clinical environment where you work. I think there are a lot of options. And when we say pretreatment IMRTQA or patient-specific IMRTQA, that it doesn't have to be an hour per patient. Does that, does that make sense? Oops. Yes. Yes, that makes sense. Great. Great. Does it, has anyone gone far? It sounds like people have been far enough in the IMRT commissioning process. Does, does anybody have any, you know, really important learning messages that they, that they have from their own personal experience in doing IMRT commissioning before they treated patients? Syed, it sounds like you, you had recently had about 50 patients. What was, what was the most important part of your IMRT commissioning learning when you were doing IMRT commissioning? We uh, started the, the PDIP plans around three, four months back. And initially we had some failures, but it, it, the failures were due to the, when uh, we were making mistakes during uh, making uh, QA plans, not putting the right dose. Some, some errors are occurring on the site of uh, console where collimator angles were not as, as defined in the planning system so the failures were occurred but these failures were just corrected during the evaluation phase when we just moved the collimation system these were the errors initially we, uh, we found during PDIP measurements great that's really that's really valuable to hear and I, I do want to say also in IMRT there's a great opportunity or a, you know not a great opportunity is the wrong word to make mistakes when you're actually generating the treatment plan and those mistakes are not sort of equipment-based mistakes or commissioning-based mistakes. They're more how you're actually creating the plan. So you can end up with hotspots in really bad places that you didn't intend that are well outside the target. And there are a whole series of things that you can do as a user when you're creating the plan that can make the plan suboptimal. And I, I think we're going to try and get our, our lead dosimetrist from UC San Diego back in the in the in the beginning of December to talk about, to give five examples of those types of errors that you can make when treatment planning. So not only errors in uh, the commissioning process, but also errors can come during the treatment planning. And I, I will say, I don't wanna sound, I feel a little bit at the end of this, like we've been speaking very negatively and you know, I have to be careful and everything's difficult and hard, but you know, it's also important to remember that the benefits to our patients of providing IMRT over 3D CRT are astronomical and they are definitely worth the additional effort and definitely worth the additional risks that IMRT bring. Uh, you know, in the context of head and neck alone, <clears throat> being able to save the salivary glands, which you can do with IMRT, which you cannot do with 3D CRT, is just a huge, huge change in patient quality of life and for the entire rest of their lives. So then there are many other examples like that. The benefits, I, can, I just want to make it clear that the benefits of IMRT very, very much outweigh any additional risk, which I'm sure you all are, already know. I just 
sort of wanted to end the presentation on a more positive note. Okay, great. Thank you so much for the presentation and thank you everyone for coming and the session was recorded and feel free to check out the Rios Contra Cancer YouTube channel as well. Excellent. Thank you very much, everybody. Really appreciate everybody's uh, comments and questions. And if you have any questions, I don't hesitate to, to reach out to me by email at any time. I'm happy to have a conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the lecture. You're very welcome. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you, Derek. It was nice.